think you'll probably find that a lot of the work Gail does not not mistaken is very much B2B and B2C direct communications. Her agency is called Make It Happen. Her clients include, um, I was really impressed actually with Gail's client base when I looked at it. She has global players like IBM, SAP, which is a huge enterprise uh, solution uh, tech provider, and Lexmark. So you're thinking the marketing sphere here, for any of you who've been studying the marketing discipline, I'm now going to hand over to Gail, so please join me in welcoming her to Map Expo 2014. B2B is one of those things where I was actually surprised when uh, Philip asked me if I'd like to speak at this. Because B2B is kind of like the forgotten cousin of marketing. Most, uh, the B2C side is pretty interesting, pretty inspiring, and you get to do some pretty cool things, whereas B2B can be a little bit of hard yards. So I'm going to try to make it as interesting as I can. I'm trying to make it as interactive as I can, and I'm going to just uh, kind of roll with it and see where we go here. I've got some slides which have a whole lot of content around the differences between B2B and B2C, and we're just going to kind of flick over those. Not, not labour the point too much here, and try to give you some examples of some of the things that go on around the development of B2B, some of the challenges that the B2B marketing people face, and some, some of the things, I guess, that I've learnt in my career in, around B2B marketing. Just to give you a bit of a background, I mean, I have, um, I've come from a, I mean, I've run this agency for 15 years. It's my own company. We have um, a passionate um, alignment to B2B. We also do some work around the not-for-profit sector and I'll get to give you an explanation as to why we do that a little bit later on. But realistically, I've also, I've also bring um, experience of being a marketing and channels director for some organisations that were pretty, you know, pretty big names within the technology industry. So I understand both sides of the fence and the, the choice I made to set up an agency was because I wanted to do something that was more strategic and tactical rather than the huge challenges that are faced by internal marketing people in terms of managing all of their internal stakeholders. They don't really have the luxury as an agency has of looking out the window and creating great things and trying to get things to, to happen. So an internal marketing person is constantly challenged, constantly constrained in time by managing all of the expectations of an organisation. So an agency doesn't have that problem. In terms of the differences between B2C and B2B, the differences really are that a consumer purchase is a relatively simple purchase. It's really to achieve, to, to address an emotional need of some kind, either I'm hungry or I'm cold or I, need, or I think I need this from a status or an ego point of view. And really there's a lot of people out there like me who might buy this product. Whereas from a B2B point of view, it's a whole lot more complex. There's generally a whole lot more people involved in the decision making process. If you look at a, a, a purchase of a tractor, well, an attractor in an organisation that's used as part of a construction company, there's engineers, there's operational people, there's people that do all the repairs, there's where we're we going to use it. A whole lot more people are involved in the decision than somebody who's going to say, oh, look, I normally buy OMO and I might buy it from Coles this week because it's on sale. So you've just got to understand those differences. A person who's buying something for B2B is making a professional decision. Often their reputation is based on the purchase. So it's kind of like, how, am I going to be a hero if I make this cho choice? Uh, is the organisation going to be happy with my choice? Often those choices are very expensive choices. You know, you spend a lot of money on making a decision. So you want to make sure that you're doing it properly. The other thing is, is that a, in a B2B market, you, you have a certain amount of um, target market that you can address. Not everybody's the same. And so you need to be very careful about who you're going after, how you're going to relate to them, what is it that they need, and how you're going to make that work for yourself. Okay, there are some similarities between it, and this is kind of really simple. I mean, really, if the product's any good, it, sh you know, it, it needs to be a good product, it needs to do what it says it's going to do, it needs to be competitive, and it needs to show some value to the target market. It's all things are the same for, across both sectors. How many of you have done uh, work experience or internships that, where you've been working with B2C? Many? Many? Okay. How many of you have done internships or experience around B2B? Not, not as many. Not as many, but some. Okay. I mean, so B2C decisions are made by an individual. They might be influenced by family, friends, other, you know, I guess, likes, all of the stuff that's going on in social media. I guess people are influenced by that. Um, marketers have to appeal to a large segment and hope that a lot of that sticks. It's not as measurable, but I mean, obviously people want to be able to get what they want when they want it. They want options around access, they want it to be at a good price point, and they want it to work for them. And they really don't have a lot of time to care about 
deep, detailed messages. Just cut to the chase. Tell me why I should buy it. And I'll, if I want to buy it, I'll buy it from you. Whereas a B2B um, sale is a whole lot more complicated. People need to feel that the product or solution, the service that they're buying is something that the organisation needs. They need to investigate a lot of, do a lot of information gathering. Why is this possible? Why is this going to be something that we could potentially use? Is this something that the organisation needs? Why is it better than somebody else's? Um, they do a lot of this fact finding now. I mean, the, the whole sales process is changed based on access to information. But organisations will do a lot of discovery. A lot of that's done online or at events, and we'll talk about some of those tactics. But the potential buyer is very well educated on what the market options are for them. And then it's about how do I make sure that my product or service or solution is appropriate to that segment? And am I going to be one of the organisations or solutions that they can discover that's a potential for them to purchase? So a lot more work needs to be done from the, the B2B marketing organisation as to making sure that their content is very well covered. The, buyer, the B2B buyer does develop a pretty close relationship with the brand because they work in conjunction with the brand and the seller of the brand on implementing a solution into their organisation. So they have a lot more best invested in that decision. It's not a whim, it's not just, you know, off the hip, you know, shoot from the hip. It's an invested decision and so they become... If, if, they, if everything lines up together behind them in terms of the product and service does what it's supposed to do, they've made a hero inside their organisation. They become fantastic advocates for that, that particular brand and continue the, mo the, the, um, the rollout of that particular brand across the organisation. Sometimes it becomes incredibly difficult to displace the brand based on that experience. And I guess the other thing that you've... Ba where there's multiple people involved, multiple stakeholders... Um, you know, if I'm buying a um, ERP software, boring, I come from a technology background, you'll be able to tell, but um, if I'm buying an ERP platform and that's like financials, then I've got CFOs, I've got uh, line managers, I might have people, production managers from the warehouse, I might have a whole lot of different people involved in that decision. And so I need to make sure that I, I've got multiple messages as a marketer into each of those groups, that they all understand there's an overarching message and then there's something that talks to each of those particular capabilities. And I guess, not surprisingly, when somebody is responsible for a large purchase, a large budget and a large decision for an organisation, there is a reasonable amount of ego involved in that choice. And you need to be conscious of that too. I guess that... Not surprisingly, organisations, when they're choosing to make a B2B decision, are looking for things that are going to change the way they do business. I mean, there is an increasing and ever, ever um, ongoing requirement to, for efficiency, productivity, uh, cost, all of the elements that organisations put together as in terms of critical, uh, for them, for critical advantage. So they're looking for products and solutions to be able to deliver that to the company. And the buying process is lengthy. It takes a long, long time to make a decision. These are generally not less than three to six months decision-making time frames, and some of them can take years. And some, organisa some organisational purchases are cyclical in nature, so it can take five, six, seven years to when they look at replacing what they've already got. So in B2B marketing, you have to completely really get who your customer is, where they are in their cycle, and know how to communicate to them appropriately. So in any kind of marketing um, exercise, you really need to understand who your customer is and where they are on their journey. So an, uh, in a B2B uh, organisation, a customer journey looks a lot like awareness. Who are you? Why are you even appropriate as being a, a potential solution to that customer? They move into consideration. How do I value you based on what other people can uh, offer me in that particular space? Evaluation, mm, you say you can do this, you say you can do that, let me just see if you really can do that um, and if you can do that better than somebody else's. And then purchase, so once they actually make the decision to purchase, you have to hope that they actually get everything that they're expecting to get out of that decision. And ultimately it's about creating loyalty and advocacy. Now different organisations have different ways of presenting their customer journey. I mean one is awareness, and then progression and deepening and closing. But ultimately what it ends up is you need to make sure that you have appropriate communication to this, this segment of the market to move them from one end of the journey to the other.
And what is it that's going to get them there? And how are you going to know where they are in that journey? What tools do you have? What communication do you have? What kind of measurement do you have? How do you know if things are connecting and working? I mean, that's the fundamental requirement of a B2B marketing campaign. Just so you know, I mean, I think it's important to understand that organisations have choices to make around uh, how they spend their marketing budgets. Things have changed an enormous amount of time uh, since I've had my agency and since I used to be the custodian and the manager of a marketing, large marketing budget. But realistically, companies need to say, where do I spend my finite amount of dollars to get me the greatest return? So this is um, statistics from this year, from the US, from a Forrester research. So organisations that are practising in the B2B space in the US have had their budget since the, in 2009 when the financial crisis, the recession hit in the US, budgets were cut from 5 to 10 percent of, of uh, spend, so of revenue spent to marketing, to less than 2 percent. Organisations just had their budgets cut completely. Um, one of the great um, wonderful areas of being in marketing is that when times are tough, there are really only two discretionary areas of budget for an organisation. One is travel and one is marketing. So when organisations are falling behind in their sales targets or you know, there's issues around how stakeholders are going to or shareholders are going to see their results, organisations focus on the things that they can do to show that they're being responsible about cutting costs to try to drive incremental profit for the business. So these, these, this is not surprising that companies went from 10% to 2%. But now, now um, based on their increased um, confidence in the marketplace, it's gone back up to an outrageous 4%. Um, that outrageous 4% is getting spread across a whole lot of activities. 20% of that funding is being spent on events, trade shows, um, smaller events. Whether we like it or not, and I'm never a great fan of great big trade shows, I've got to say, as a marketing, as a marketing person, um, but they're an important part of awareness. They are not, an import they are not um, as powerful as prospect progression events where further, when, when contacts are further down the journey, they would value having something which is far more intimate, far more appropriate to their issues, rather than an all-singing, all-dancing, great big trade show. However, in terms of getting awareness out to a brand, having an organisation being able to position what it is they do in that environment, very important that they spend money in that space. Digital advertising and marketing, it's one of those things where organisations are they view it as a more affordable channel into the market. You have to have created a relationship in Australia with a prospect to be able to fully leverage um, email marketing, whereas in the US they do a lot of um, harvesting of email, so a different kind of approach there based on privacy. But um, it is still a, a cheap form of advertising, a cheap form of promotion. You just got to make sure that your messaging is appropriate, otherwise you spam and no one will ever read anything you've ever sent them ever again. In terms of content marketing, as we said at the beginning, B2B, the B2B audience needs to be educated. How you educate them is a whole lot of things from uh, case studies. Tell me why. Tell me why organisations of my size or in my industry or have my challenge have gone with your product and solution. Case studies do that for you. It's somebody else telling the benefits of your product. White papers. They love to be, you know, people you know, who are making a complex buying decision that's going to sp uh, uh, spend a whole lot of money on that. They need assets and resources to be able to submit with their business case. You know, white papers do that. They'd be able to share the load in terms of selling the story. Uh, blogs. I mean, one of the, the greatest in opportunities for organisations to speed up the customer journey is to have really good content on their website that drives organic inbound search from organisations who know they have a need, who decide that based on what they see that you say you do, that you're probably someone that they should use as a consider move you straight into consideration process and cut down a whole lot of the dance that's required to get you even in that point. So, you know, organisations underestimate the value of having really good content on their site. Website itself, some of them have not been changed in five years. I mean, the whole marketplace requires people to keep their, their information current. Work, work it, make it, do, do what you can with that.
PR you're going to talk about today, so I won't bother with that. I mean, it's a very important area and it's a specialised area. We don't, ha don't have, never have touch PR, but I've used it extensively when I was the marketing director. Above the line advertising, I mean, most of the focus for B2B is below the line. I'm not even sure if that term's still used, but it is in my, at my era. So everything is about um, ROI, what happened as a result of pretty much measurement, measurement, measurement is what drives all of the things that we do in that space. Other is a very big percentage. Other is things like marketing automation. I mean, marketing automation is, is kind of changing the game, you know, how a lot of organisations get campaigns out, how they, you know, they preempt the next step. They, a lot of investment in things like Marketo and Aliqua and a whole lot of sophisticated tools there. Unfortunately, what it requires is a really good understanding of the data of, the, of your, who is your target. Organisational data generally is atrocious. Um, most companies do not really give it the quality of effort that it deserves. And so, you know, it's about having, most companies have great big gaps in their data. They don't have coverage of all the titles that are important to them. They don't have permission to email them. You know, there's a whole lot of issues that go on in data before marketing automation can be useful. Just some lessons about B2B marketing. If I can, if there's no engagement between sales and marketing, marketing will fail. Because ultimately as a B2B marketer, you need to have somebody close the deal. So either it's your internal sales force if you're a vendor, or it's your channel sales force or, or trade if you're using a, um, intermediaries in, this, in the sales process. But if you're not aligned between sales and marketing, then marketing will always hold the, hold the brunt of blame for anything that doesn't go right. So before you actually go down the path of creating any kind of campaign, make sure that there is very strong alignment between sales and marketing. Does my understanding as a marketer of what sales want as a lead, as an opportunity, does that actually match to what sales want? Because if it doesn't, then it's not a lead. And if it's not a lead, sales won't do anything with it, which means that marketing will have generated and spent all this money and effort and time and felt really good about generating a whole lot of leads, and sales will never do anything with them. So it's really, really important that you have a very strong understanding of that, and you need to get skin in the game from sales before you actually go too far down the road from a marketing activity. You need to be understanding that offers are important, and offers are not the same in B2C as they are in B2B. This is not, a, this is not about, you know, it's not necessarily about a price promotion. Offers could be about, um, we could do an audit. We can come in and have a look at how you're doing things and make recommendations as to how you can improve things. I mean, we work with a, um, an FMCG company, and one of their approaches is that you know, they encourage their sales, their salespeople encourage their prospects to enable them to walk through their manufacturing facility so that they can identify areas where there is an opportunity to improve efficiency, workplace safety. So that's a different offer, but it's still a very valuable offer to the prospect. Okay, so what are they, what are marketers, B2B marketers focus on? Customer acquisition. Um, uh, brand awareness is something that's incredibly important and unless you are a local company, most brand activities are uh, driven out of a head office function. So you, you do basically what you're told to do, you extend opportunity, you extend brand activities into your own market, but a lot of those things are predetermined outside of your control. So in terms of uh, local um, you know, marketing director's role, your, op your responsibility is around customer acquisition customer retention, PR, so that you can make sure that you are maximising the benefits of all of your wins and minimising the damage of any of your not so good um, outcomes. Um, internal marketing so that people are actually know what's going on and they can be aligned. And, and also your, whatever your go-to-market strategy is, so channel, trade, whatever that is. So as a marketing director, you may have multiple people underneath, you know, in your organisation. Um, so you might have product management, you might have channel marketing people, you might have um, some kind of, um, in some of these organisations they have evangelists, product specialists that go out and do all the, hard, the hard, hard yards around getting people excited. So it's about working out how all of that kind of holds together. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about customer acquisition. 
because customer acquisition, don't, don't ever underestimate that most B2B marketing budgets are allocated based on the expectation of what will I get out of spending this money. It's all about lead generation, really. Everything comes back to is it measurable and is it lead? So it all comes back to return on investment. Brand is a highly valuable, very difficult to measure. It has great value as an organisational asset, but realistically, brand just gets you on, you know, the outcome of brand is that you'll be invited to the dance. So you want to make sure that that's important. Two more minutes. Oh my goodness, sorry. Um, in terms of customer acquisition, social media is important. In B2B, it's LinkedIn and YouTube. It's not Facebook. Um, so organisations set up their own communities around that. Public relations is important. Telemarketing, oh, it's, you know, it's one of those things that's kind of looked down on as the ugly part of marketing. Telemarketing is incredibly important in terms of generating closure on opportunities. So either it's done through inside sales or it's done through an external agency. So look, this is a large campaign done for IBM globally. Um, Make It Happen worked with these guys. We've worked with them for a long period of time. And this is about bringing two very big organisations together into the mid-market. IBM and SAP, not, not brands that you'd expect to play in the mid-market, but play indeed they did. Organisations, when they produce assets for a global rollout, spend a lot of time and money developing stuff that nobody wants to use. So this was about creating a whole series of assets, asking countries, will you use it? This is how you use it. Here's a plan. Here's how you use it. Here's your campaign flow. It's pretty simple. If you want to take this and roll this out and use it in events, here's all the materials. It's in your local language. Go, go, go. Um, Organisations like Schaeffler are an engineering company. They sell bearings. It's very hard to make bearings fascinatingly interesting as an agency, but we do our very best. Um, these guys position a lot into mining. Their big, their big investment every year is in the mining exhibitions. They need to make their stand inviting. Their stand always does an awesome job. We're pretty proud of our work on this particular stand. Um, and they invite people into the stand by showing them what they do. This is the industry that we're in. This is your industry. Here's our solutions. Come talk to us. You know, very target market, very targeted products. You know, a direct sales force and a channel, so they need to provide materials for both. So different kinds of things. This is a, an, a, uh, an organisation who came to us and said, we want a loyalty and rewards program. Well, that's fine, but really what they needed was a, a, a channel enablement program because none of their distributors or none of their distributor salespeople understood their products. So ultimately, those two things kind of aligned. So look, B2B agency world is very varied. You can do anything from a all singing, all dancing, great big exhibition to a $10,000 or less campaign to try to generate eight appointments for somebody. You've got to be flexible as an agency. And I guess understanding what the client's trying to do, getting some close um, alignment between sales and marketing is important. And try to be as creative as you can be. In, in often, many of these brands have such tight requirements around their, their uh, imagery, their tone of voice. You've, you know, sometimes B2B marketing looks pretty boring. Just understand that there's often it's the best the agency can do to push the envelope. Any questions? How about a round of applause for Gail? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, what I would say listening to Gail, thank you so much, Gail. It's really important all of you in this room understand, um, and Gail touched on it, that the principles of communications, uh, Gail was specifically talking about marketing activities, they are the same, whether it's B2B or B2C. And can I tell you that most, most of you here, because you are consumers, you haven't been probably in B2B environments. I cut my teeth in B2B when I entered uh, public relations back in the, in the mid-90s. Uh, the principles are the same. And I think there's some really good insights Gail gave you. Although her skew is towards business to business, the principles are the same. Understand the customer, understand the motivation, understand the, the process, understand the path to, to purchase. It sounds like corny metaphors and, and phrases. It's really important. I think there's some great insights there. I'm going to throw it to the floor with the roving mic. Um, and again, no question is a bad one or a silly one. Was there something that you heard from Gail you thought, mm, don't quite get that, would like to know a little bit more? Could I ask her a specific question about some of the work she does? So over to you guys for a moment.
Questions? Down the back? How do you calculate like return on investment when it comes to like marketing, promotions, etc.? Isn't it kind of hard because some of the stuff is like more, you might see it in the long term, like some of the results? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I think that when we, um, when we do an ROI kind of calculation for a client, we base it on a, um, how, many, how many leads did we get? Uh, what's happening, you know, what kind of leads are they? You know, are they, where are they in their journey? What is the value of that particular lead? And then how do we convert that into a sales engagement? Unfortunately, as a marketeer, you're not a salesperson. So when you hand over really good quality leads to a sales guy, you still depend on the sales guy to close it. But if you say that when, uh, a lead is worth a certain amount of money based on the meeting all of these criteria, we use a thing called BANT as a measurement of lead value. Um, so BANT means budget, authority, need, and time frame. So if somebody who, you, you identify an opportunity for, some, for a salesperson, and uh, that particular opportunity exhibits a lot of those characteristics, it's a higher propensity, a higher probability that that will close as a sale than if it doesn't. Do you understand what I mean? So if you've got the, you know, if you're selling a great big tractor and the person can only afford a moped, there's not much point in even thinking that that's gonna be a great quality lead for a salesperson. But if all of the other things align, you would expect there would be a higher propensity for that to, to, to be a, a converted lead. And you base it on an estimate of what that lead could be worth. So, you know, when we do a, um, a campaign, like a, if we do an outbound campaign for a client, we would normally expect to get 5 to 15% lead and nurture conversion. Nurture is when an organisation exhibits some of those characteristics, but not all of them. So, you know, organisations might be, might be almost ready, but they have no authority. This person might be almost ready, but he has no authority. So it, it dismisses the value of that. So if you keep communicating with them, then building them up to the point where they are a higher value lead, you've got a greater chance of converting. That was a great question, by the way. And, and I would just um, amplify some comments Gail made. Now, more than ever, Gail put up some statistics there. What did she say? Marketing spend pre-GFC, so before you guys were even at uni, doesn't seem that long ago to people like us, but you know, sort of five, six years ago, was five to 10% marketing spend of a business's turnover. Dropped to 2%, it's gone back, as Gail said, to the healthy 4%, and now they want more. I'll tell you what the world you're going into, doesn't matter what agency or in-house or not-for-profit or government job you might go into in comms, marketing, advertising, Everybody wants more out of you and wants more from their spend. It's more challenging than ever. So, tip for you, start to understand business. Understand that what you do impacts on business, not just brand. Understand how to think about things like how return on investment is, is triggered. You don't need to know all the detail, you don't need to be economists. The things I tell my guys every day in the agency is understand business and just basic business. And if you've done some of that in your course today, you're better, you're better um, set up than some of your colleagues from other unis. A, a question I would have for Gail, on your behalf, how have you seen social media change and impact the B2B environment rather than just the B2C? Have you seen brands start to embrace social media in any form and use it productively and proactively mm -hmm. to reach their customer base, to engage their customer base, and through the channel, as we say. So, role of social media in B2B, maybe, Gail? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, Organisations um, uh, need, to, need to really think about how they're going to use social media before they run out and do social media. And I think large companies have large, a large amount of people who can generate a lot of content and can make that kind of work. In a B2B environment, we talked about LinkedIn and YouTube being the most appropriate channels, plus a blog, which kind of really fits alongside that. So organisations look at how can they engage with their communities? Can they build a community? Is there a community that already exists on LinkedIn? Do you guys know much about LinkedIn? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the value is that there's the communities that exist at least exist because they have liked interests or liked requirements. So if a, if a vendor can align themselves to a community or create a community or provide content that could be shared through that community, it's really about extending the awareness of that, of that organisation rather than a lead generation platform. 
Very few people get leads from social media in B2B. It's really an adjunct to awareness and perhaps can help around consideration. But really, it's, it's a, you know, YouTube it gives people an opportunity of being able to reduce some of the demonstration times or experience that they need to be able to share information that will help them in the buying decision. I mean, a lot of, a lot of um, products and services need to be shown. And so you can use YouTube to help you show them. So that can also mean that you can, uh, buyers or potential buyers can all do a lot of that self-service understanding before you're actually engaged with them. So in terms of social, a lot of clients try to, da try to dabble in it and then don't commit to the, maintain the resources to keep it going. Nothing's worse than a really poorly followed site. So, you know, if you've got, if you've got 100 Twitter followers, really, is that worth doing? Um, you know, if you're, if you're trying to build out your LinkedIn um, environment and it's not about the company, it's about the person, I mean, where's the benefit? So, unless you're a company that has a very good understanding of I am going to commit to providing content, the content's going to be really good on that platform, I know how to use it, I know how to push it, then you have to query whether it's actually a really strong use of funds. That's it. Thanks, Gail. Have a round of applause for Gail.